I'm Liz Sauer, and this is Ghosts in the Burbs, a podcast of ghost stories from Wellesley, Massachusetts. A warning, adults who use adult language told me these frightening tales, these ghost stories, aren't for kids. The high holy season is in full swing here in Wellesley. The October full moon was so bright that it cast shadows. I just finished reading Reprieve by James Hahn Matson. Consider it required reading. I'm gearing up to watch The Lost Boys tonight, and I'm listening to the Witches of Eastwick soundtrack on my walks, all the while alternately sipping a pumpkin spice latte and chugging moon water. I wish all of you who live in October country year-round the happiest Halloween. This, the second and final part of the estate, is the end of this batch of ghost stories for the season. I intend to put out a couple listener episodes this week, though they sure do seem to touch a nerve with people. I like listening to ghost stories, that's why I started this podcast. I know I'm not great with the whole technical side of this journey, so thank you for putting up with me. I'll be on hiatus again until after the new year. The holidays and producing this podcast are not a pretty color on me. A new puppy arrives at our house on the 27th a baby Westie that I know Artie, Walter, and Brandy picked out just for us, so I intend to enjoy the hell out of him at the detriment to all else. Brace yourselves for a lot of social media photos. Now, having shared all of that, in addition to all the fun I've been having this autumn, I've been lighting a lot of sage with pumpkin-scented candles and sprinkling black salt at the edges of our property because, as it turns out, Heather, Josh, and their boy's situation was far worse than we ever could have imagined. We're on to the conclusion of ghost story number 62. The Estate, Part 2. If you've been listening to these stories for some time now, you know that my family has moved around a lot. We've had minor renovations done on our homes over the years, but nothing major. Just a wall taken down here, a bathroom reno there, new floors, paint, wallpaper, that sort of thing. But we've never taken the plunge and made real structural changes to any of these homes. Our new house is a different story. We're in the process of drawing up plans to add on to it, to create some more living space. And then I had to go talk to Heather and Josh and I'm second guessing the entire project. Living in this town and knowing all that I do about how epically strange things are is enough to make one hit an 11 on the paranoia scale. Hearing and seeing ghosts, notch it up to about a 13. Absolutely devouring hashtag prepper talk content shoves me into the 20s. You get the point. But with all of that said, I don't think that I'm the only one who feels something coming. Something powerful and world shifting, like reality bending. And I think it's gonna be painful. The energy swirling around right now feels so tight, like it's about to snap. Those sinkhole gnomes showed and visions of the end, right? In my brief experience near that sinkhole, I read their vibe as like expectant. They told me no one should be in this area. Now I'm wondering if it wasn't so much an admonishment as it was a warning. If something big is coming, whatever it is, then it makes sense to me in a strange way that the beings that haunt the shadows are now emboldened to step out and attempt their worst. Josh and Heather's situation is a good example. Why now? Why after so many years did something in their woods begin to stalk them? Sure, they have renovated the garage, but as we'll soon hear, that's how it got inside. What prompted the thing to start harassing them in the first place? I think things are crawling out of the woodwork right now because the conditions are familiar to them. Uncertainty, sorrow, anger, fear, anxiety, we're swimming in a sea of energy that is supercharged right now, and these dark entities are emboldened to step out into an atmosphere that's pleasant for them. Again, the vibe, the energy, the feeling is so tight, like we're all being wound up and we're damn close to the breaking point. Or maybe it's just me. Maybe I just need to get a good night's sleep and swap the coffee for chamomile tea. Maybe I'm allowing my anxiety to draw connections where there are none. Maybe. Either way, I'm in no position to offer advice. But if I were to offer any, I'd tell you all to be exceedingly kind to yourselves right now. 
my crazy nervousness aside, this is a true shit show. Over the years, we've heard about all the demonic influence in this town, and that's scary, but we have traditions to bind or banish that shit and send it back to where it came from. There are some things that can't be bound. Things that draw their power not just from the spiritual realm, but from the earth. These beings are older than old. There's no winning with them. In fact, there's no game. It just is what it is. So, let's check back in with Heather and Josh and see what that means for a family targeted by such a powerful entity. When we left them, they were about to tell us how the monster got into their home. Here we go. After admitting the renovations allowed the entity into their home, Josh shifted in his seat and cleared his throat. The day the crew came and took down the old structure, well, that night, actually, I was at the dining room table. The room shares a wall with a garage. Now there's a big mud room in between the two spaces, but at the time, it was just a wall. I was up late catching up on emails, and I heard something knocking on that wall. Initially, I thought something had come loose, a piece of equipment or a loose wire, something of that sort that hadn't been secured by the construction crew. The electricity had been cut out there, but I didn't want electrical cords flailing about in the wind, so I went out to check. I looked over and saw that Heather was anxiously kneading her hands, and her eyes were moving between Biddy and I, as if scanning us for disbelief. Her uneasiness filled the room. It was suffocating. I offered her a reassuring smile and tried to refocus my attention on Josh. He was explaining that the old garage had been built on a concrete slab, and the guys had swept the debris clean that afternoon before they wrapped for the day. The site was exceptionally tidy, he said. I didn't find anything out of place, but while I was searching for the source of that banging, I noticed the marks. The prints, I should say. He held his hand out, fingers folded down as if he were mimicking a paw. They were about the size of my hand, but with six toes and claws. The muddy prints started at the back of the garage, what used to be the garage, I mean, so whatever it was came from the direction of the backyard and came right up to the house. Up the house, actually. Josh rubbed his palms against his thighs. Up the house, I repeated. Those prints went all the way to the second floor. The builders had to remove a window, and it just had plastic over it. That's how we think it got inside, Heather explained shakily. It climbed up the side of your house? That's what we're saying, Josh replied shortly. Have you seen this creature? Betty asked. The couple shook their heads. I checked the entire house that night, top to bottom, every closet, every corner, and under every damn bed, Josh added bitterly. Besides a partial muddy footprint beneath the open window, I didn't find a damn thing. And after that night, you began seeing shadows in the house, I guessed? Yes, and the voices started too. What do the voices say? Biddy asked. It's not so much what they say, Heather explained, but how they say it. They sound like us, or it sounds like us, I should say. We hear each other when that's impossible. I'd be home alone, and I would hear one of the boys calling to me from the top floor. When I went to check, no one would be up there. No one is allowed in the house alone anymore, Josh said seriously. Its voice is just too convincing, Heather added. That's because it isn't just mimicking them, it's absorbing them, Claire interjected. This is really bad. Ask them about their health. Um, how have you all been feeling, health-wise, I mean, I asked clunkily. Heather and Josh's eyes met, and she reached for his hand. I'm having some trouble with my heart, Josh admitted. He had a heart attack in the spring. Chad, our youngest, is getting migraines, and I was recently diagnosed with Crohn's, Heather explained. How about your oldest, uh, Derek, Josh supplied. Right, Derek. Has he had any problems with his health? No. Confused, Biddy pressed, but you said he's been the most affected by the situation here. Right, his personality, it's... Josh cut his wife off. We are concerned about Derek's mental health. Claire sniffed. That's an understatement. Our family's physical health has been a concern, Josh said, resting his elbows on his knees. But mentally, all of us are struggling. None of us are sleeping well. 
The nightmares have been awful, Heather admitted. You're all having these nightmares? Betty asked. I could feel some of the anxiety leave the room as it was replaced with terror. Don't let your guard down, Claire instructed. I wasn't planning on it, I muttered. Three sets of eyes searched my face. What is it? Betty asked, an edge in her voice. Sorry, just nothing. I shook my head and offered the couple a shaky smile. Were the dreams about anything in particular? Their demeanor changed dramatically. They looked, well, I suppose the only word for it would be guilty. Tell them it's not them, Claire insisted. That thing is putting those images into their minds. Whatever you're dreaming about, I said, it isn't you. I mean, the dreams aren't coming from your subconscious. You're being influenced by something. Josh huffed. We know that, but it doesn't make them any less unnerving. What are you dreaming about? Betty asked bluntly. Murder, Heather admitted. We sat in silence for a stretch. It was obvious that the couple were deeply influenced by whatever the hell it was that was haunting their family, but for the life of me, I couldn't put my finger on what that was exactly. And Claire wasn't offering any hints. One thing I knew for certain, I wasn't about to open myself up to the energies in their home, even though I could feel that energy testing me, willing me to recognize them. One thing was for sure, Heather and Josh's problem was not demonic. I'd gathered that the entity plaguing them wasn't just one, but many, and whenever I tried to sneak a glimpse at it, the forest filled my mind. In our dreams, we... Josh trailed off, staring out into the trees. We murder each other. Every single night, Heather admitted, wiping her eyes. In devastating ways. The dreams, nightmares, are incredibly real. Vivid. There's no way to tell that you're dreaming when you're in it, not until you wake up. I've stabbed the boys, strangled my wife, poisoned them all with a meal, shoved them down the back stairs, hit them over the head with a shovel. Every single dream ends with me dragging their bodies through the woods to the lake, to the hole next to the lake. Like a sinkhole? Betty asked, throwing me a significant look. Exactly, said Heather. In our dreams, we we throw the bodies down that awful hole, and here, she just shook her head. Crunching, Josh finished. Jesus. Have you gone down to look at the lake to check if there really is a hole in that spot? Betty asked. Yes, it's there, replied Josh. That can't be a coincidence. What do you mean? asked Heather. You aren't the only ones in our neighborhood with this problem, I explained. I just interviewed a woman on Livingston with a sinkhole in her backyard. She's having nightmares too, Heather asked, hopefully. No, there's something down there that's talking to her, telling her things. Great, Josh growled. So the entire neighborhood's a problem. Maybe, I conceded, but it feels more complicated than that. Things are still cloudy, but it's almost like there are pockets of trouble or like breakthrough places, places so thin everything exists at once. Sorry, I don't know what the hell I'm saying. Looking more concerned than I felt comfortable with, Betty said, No, that sounds incredibly specific. It sure does, Josh muttered. So what are we supposed to do? What are your ghosts telling you? Heather demanded, her voice just this side of shrill. Well, they, I mean she, there's only one here right now, and she's concerned about your sons. Heather's eyes widened. They're at school. I can call the office, I suppose, and ask the secretary to pull them out of class. No, 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 I interrupted. It isn't that urgent. Yes, it is, Claire corrected. But if we could meet with them as soon as it was convenient, Biddy suggested. Sure, tomorrow, after school? Um, I don't know, I said trying to take in all Claire was saying and still remain present. Are you going to walk through the house? Josh asked, suddenly sounding rather pissed. Um, I shot Biddy a pleading look. She shrugged. Of course, where do you want to start? The basement, Heather and Josh said without hesitation. Biddy laughed. <laughs> that was fast. It seems to be the center of our current issues. I felt the floor vibrate beneath my sneakers. Oh? We think that's where it stays, 
Heather said, shakily. Claire was speaking so insistently that I wasn't really paying attention to the conversation around me, so I was surprised when everyone stood. We're going now? I said dumbly. No time like the present, Betty replied, with what I could tell was forced calm. The floor vibrated. Did you feel that? Feel what? Josh demanded. The floor, it... I trailed off. Never mind, let's see that basement. We left the once cozy, now spooky room and walked through the kitchen to a small hall that led to what appeared to be a formal dining room. The hall held two doors, one to a powder room, the other, as we saw once Josh had unbolted two locks and unslid the chain lock, to the basement stairs. Forgive me for not going with you, said Heather, backing into the dining room. I just, I hate it down there. All right, then, said Betty, taking the lead. We'll be right back. Don't say that, I groaned. Why not? I just sighed. Down the stairs we went, and I couldn't help but flash back to another set of basement stairs Biddy and I had ventured down in the not-so-distant past. I was dizzy, tense, terrified. I gripped onto the handrail for dear life and held my breath as I stepped off the bottom stair onto a shockingly plush burnt sienna carpet and took in the finished basement. Overhead track lighting buzzed. There was a ping-pong table and two old-school arcade games, Pac-Man and Galaga. I know people pronounce that differently, but that's how I grew up saying it, so tomato-tomato. A floral sofa set in pink, cream, and green sat before an old flat screen. The far back corner held a full set of weights, a treadmill, and a Nordic track. I hadn't seen one of those in a very long time. The boys used to spend a great deal of time down here, Josh offered. Video games with their friends and... As he rambled on, my eyes were drawn to the workout equipment. Who uses this stuff? Derek, mostly, Josh replied. I used to use the treadmill, but I don't feel comfortable doing so now. But Derek feels all right down here, Biddy said. It's where he spends most of his time. So the two of you and your oldest boy, Chad, Josh supplied. Thank you, Chad, Biddy continued, are frightened of this space. You think this is where whatever it is that's haunting your family hides out, but Derek spends most of his time down here? Well, that's why we... Josh began to explain. I walked away from them towards that back corner, drawn to it while simultaneously being utterly repelled by its energy. Can you see it? I whispered. No, it's not here, Claire replied. This is the energy it leaves behind? How bad is it when it's actually in the house? You don't want to know, Claire muttered. Listen. I did as she suggested. I felt the carpet beneath my feet vibrate. Oddly, the gym area didn't have different flooring. I don't hear anything. Just be quiet. Shush. I closed my eyes and tried to ignore the intensifying vibrations beneath my feet. Drifting off momentarily, I was startled when I felt Betty's hand on my arm. Are you okay? It took me a moment to respond. I'm fine. Listen, I said, turning to Josh, who looked absolutely horrified. What the hell had I done or said while I was zoned out? You need to move. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. We can push this thing out of the house and back to the woods, but that will not solve your overarching problem. No one should live here. It's too blurry. Something brought this entity forth, but it's not of as much concern as the... Don't use that word. They won't understand. Claire insisted, cutting me off. Ah, it's the location of your house. What, are we on an Indian burial ground or something? Josh demanded. No, if that were the case, you could tear down and do your best to make amends and reparations. This is different. This is earthbound. It's more ancient than ancient. I felt myself slipping again, getting a little fuzzy. Biddy held onto my upper arm and guided me back to the stairs. Come on, we can talk in the kitchen. We went up, made arrangements to keep in touch. I shared my realtor's information with Heather and assured them that we would get in touch with Judith immediately, after explaining how she would be able to clear the house of the ill-intentioned entity that had taken up residence in their basement. You let us know when we can meet your sons, Biddy said. Is that still necessary? asked Heather. 
Um, once we get Judith here, I'd like to gauge how affected they've been by the situation, I replied vaguely. But once we get rid of that thing and move, Josh began. You don't want anything tagging along with you, Biddy said firmly. Oh, Heather breathed. Oh, no. We left them to their heightened worries and anxieties. We can't go straight to my house. We need to walk to, like, shake all of that off, I insisted as we scurried down the driveway. It's the land, huh? Yeah, but... So what do you think? Can Judith clear this, or do we need to call in a Wiccan, too? No, I mean, probably, if it's not too late, but we are in really big trouble, I said, speeding up. I sense a move coming on. Biddy laughed, matching my pace effortlessly. No. I stopped walking and grabbed her arm. Those people, yes, they are screwed. They have to move immediately. I'm pretty sure one of their sons is possessed. So it's demonic? No, I don't really know what it is, but it comes from the land. It's like, I think that baker guy woke something up when he created the lake. Those gnomes and Anne Sinkhole. Gnomes? Yeah, they're like part of it. I don't know. If there was a hierarchy, then they are definitely above the thing, the entity that is in Heather and Josh's house, but they're also amused by it. They don't care about people, unless we get in their way, but all of that is beside the point. They're just waiting for the end. Whatever happens until then, whatever damage they can do to humanity to pay us back, that's, like, amusing to them. What in the fuck are you talking about? The end? Like, the end end? The end end. I started walking again. We've had it all wrong. The demons, the ghosts, everything bopping along up here. It's all like a game. The earth, those that inhabit the earth, that's who we should be terrified of. They don't go under any law but their own. The angels and demons, they exist under a set of rules and they play fair. But the earth dwellers, we were fine until we woke them up. They're waking up. They can end it all. We walked along in silence, passing right by my driveway. Eventually, Betty asked, So are we going to talk to their son or... Fuck no, I spat. I don't think he's human anymore. Possessed, Betty said. No. Replaced. Forever? I think so, I replied sadly. I'm beginning to think that maybe we should all move. Too late, said Claire. Judith came and worked what magic she could. The entity was pushed back to the forest, and with the help of a Wiccan priestess and a Reiki master, it was pulled from the boy. The removal left gaps within him that will remain, that must be protected so that other beings can't jump in. He'll never be the same. Old me would have pulled up stakes without another thought, would have started the packing and purging cycle and run, but I see now that there isn't anywhere to run. Nowhere is better or safer or less fucked. My gut tells me we need to brace ourselves and weather the coming storm. But for now, we wait. Head over to ghostintheburbs.com for all the links. I've put a pause on collecting your super fun spooky stories. I don't want there to be too deep of a backlog, and I have enough stories for several more episodes. So thank you to everyone who has recorded a story. As you know, I've made a commitment to keep our, spe our space excuse me, both completely free and ad-free. But if you are interested in doing something priceless to help the show, please tell a spooky, like-minded friend about it. Rate and review it wherever you listen, and follow me at Ghosts in the Burbs on Instagram and um, now TikTok. Those three things are incredibly valuable. And while you're at it, please do it for other podcasts that you enjoy. That's all for now. Good night, sleep tight, and don't forget your nightlight. <laughs>